This is quite a shock. On the other hand, it's not surprising in the least. In this video, we're going to look at the changes coming to Stellaris with the new Machine Age DLC. Specifically, the changes coming to Machine Empires, both Gestalt Consciousness Machine Empires and the brand new Individualistic Machine Empires. On top of that, we're going to be looking at the three new Ascension Paths, Virtuality, Nanotechnology and Modularity. We're also getting a sneak peek at the new machine ship set and some of the new city backgrounds. Everything will be chaptered, stick around for all of that and more as we dive in. One of the first big new changes coming to Machine Empires is History Traits. These have been added for all machine species whether they are Gestalt or Individualist. They are all zero point traits that let you choose a little more of your backstory and these define your original purpose as robots. Were you originally created as research assistants, conversational AI chatbots, worker bots, or perhaps a domestic servant nanny bot meant to make life easier and pass the butter? Six backgrounds with relatively minor bonuses are available for you to choose from. These are, as I said, available to both Gestalt and individualistic machines. Taking a quick look at the bonuses, as a Gestalt Consciousness Empire, I suspect Nanny Bots here is going to be the best zero point trait to choose. That's on the bottom left and that grants a nice additional 5% amenities from jobs, thus reducing the number of maintenance drones you'll need to have empire wide, giving you greater pop efficiency. Another good one might be Research Assistance, giving you a very small but reasonable plus 2% to Physics, Society and Engineering research output. Otherwise, we've got War Machines for plus 5% army damage, Art Generator for a meager 2% unity from jobs. I can't really see that one being very useful. Conversational AI giving you minus 2% upkeep from jobs. Again, I don't think that's particularly effective, though you could stack it with some other bonuses to get some upkeep reductions on maybe your alloy workers and research jobs, thus reducing the need for basic worker drones. And finally, worker bots grants a tidy 5% minerals from jobs. But yeah, definitely nanny bot here is number one for a guest out empire, with I think research assistance being kind of a close second. This is great. This is a nice zero point addition that is going to give your machines a little bit of extra flavor and backstory. So each empire in theory will be a little bit different. There are also a handful of other new traits or variants of existing biological traits for machine species as well, including having a dedicated engineering or sociology core or integrated weaponry to a delicate chassis or scarcity subroutines. For example here, integrated weaponry, giving you plus 100% army damage and plus 5 enforcers crime reduction. Physics core, very similar to natural physicists, giving you 15% additional physics from jobs. Please put your weapon down, you have 20 seconds to comply. As we go through some of the other screenshots later in this dev diary, you will see often that individualistic machines can now take traits that look like the regular bio traits. So in a lot of ways, machines are now much closer to a regular bio playthrough if you go with the individualistic type of machines. There are still going to be some differences that we'll cover in just a moment, but we are bringing machines much closer to regular bio empires. This next change I believe might be a little bit controversial. I think there could be some mixed reactions, so Bear with me and let's get to the end of explaining what is changing here before you start shouting in my comments section. There are changes coming to machines, aging and unplanned obsolescence. Immortality is a funny thing in Stellaris. Under some circumstances, especially as the game goes on, due to the accident and death events that could target machines, you can end up in a state where a theoretically immortal machine leader is actually far more vulnerable to death as the years went on than a normal biological leader. Machine leaders will now instead use lifespan rules but enjoy some extra benefits. So machines will no longer be immortal, they won't have a chance of dying due to unplanned obsolescence because at the moment machines have this chance where they could just break down one of your machine leaders um, randomly. They might be five, they might be 500 and they could still just randomly shut down. That is gone. Now though, 
As real go-getters, your starting age will be between 5 and 10 years old. So at the age of 30, you can run your science department with 20 years of experience. All machines also have an additional plus 20 years to their default lifespan of 80, resulting in a base lifespan of 100 years. This does mean, though, that robots aren't immortal. Even though in theory you could replace lots of different pieces in the robot, I suppose the, the, the theme or the roleplay here is that the delicate internal brain equivalent that they've got, their internal hard drive, cannot be copied across to a new, a new repository, and then you can't just you know, keep living forever in slightly different bodies. That doesn't seem great, but you know it is what it is. They are now affected by lifespan increasing technologies and modifiers, for example those from ascension paths, which are going to be covered a bit later. In summary, your machine leaders no longer need to fear random death and will live to the ripe old age of 100 years without any additional improvement. Some forms of immortality, however, have been retained, like the Gestalt councils and some special ascension traits. Also, all virtual machine leaders, that's a new thing, virtual leaders, we'll get to virtual stuff in a minute, and oh my goodness me, I'm excited by that. They are bringing Pantheon into Stellaris and I am here for it. All virtual machine leaders are immortal, while modularity, which is a new tradition, has access to advanced lifespan increasing traits that can be applied to your machines. Similar rules will apply to robots, though they have a starting age of 1 to 5 years and do not get the plus 20 lifespan bonus that the machines have. I think this doesn't mean individualistic robots, I, I think this means kind of the base robot technology might be able to generate leaders, but I'm, I'm really not exactly sure what they mean here when they say robots. Both biological empires going synthetic and machine empires will also reset their age upon completing ascension to reflect receiving their new body. So you can one time only swap over your consciousness to a new body, but you can't repeatedly do that, it seems, even after you've ascended, which I find a little paradoxical. Somewhat paradoxically, altogether, these changes should actually result in your machine leaders being able to better withstand the test of time than they could when they were theoretically immortal. So, overall here, machine leaders in theory, even though it won't say it in game and it might feel bad, are going to be living longer on average than they do at present whilst they are technically theoretically immortal. That's an important point to make. On the other side of things, some of the thematics here I don't like, honestly. I think that machines should be able to copy their consciousness across to another robot body, at least for Gestalt empires. Maybe not individualistic machines, especially if each robot or each machine in an individualistic machine empire is vastly different and thus they, you know, there's no different repository that is equivalent to the internal architecture you have in your robot and thus you couldn't pass your mind over to a new body. But for Gestalt Consciousness Empires, where they've got a bunch of drones that are meant to all be the same, I really can't see why those leaders can't just be functionally immortal. Perhaps there should be some sort of special project once you've ascended to transfer the consciousness of one leader into a new body and reset their age. Maybe an agenda or a special project. That would be cool. I'm not sure. We can see here from the screenshot that's been on your screen for quite a while here, this is a new Gestalt machine leader that has an age of 100 and a death chance of 0% because they're only 8. Sorry, uh, they're the age lifespan of 100, I should say. Underneath the caption reads, 100 years is a lot better than how long my last smartphone survived. Which, um, yeah, that's quite true, actually. Another change that may be very controversial amongst machine enjoyers is habitability. Habitability is going to be going the way of the dodo. Presently, machines get plus 200% habitability as a base for all planets. That means machines can do whatever they want. This did limit, however, the ability for the devs to give certain origins to the machines. For example, void dwellers were prevented from being a machine or a machine origin because machines could then live anywhere and just ignore the void dweller part. Several other origins as well had similar issues. The devs still wanted to retain the flavor of machines having an easier time dealing with alternate climates though, so machines now use the habitability system similar to organics. This is a massive change, okay? A massive, massive change that machines are no longer perfectly able to live on every planet all the time. 
I'm not sure exactly how I feel about this. I think it it could make sense thematically. For example, if your machines are built and able to withstand desert planets, and then you go and live on an ocean world that's full of water, that might cause some issues to your delicate electronics. I can, I can see that being reasonable, absolutely. However, it's going to be a big shift for a lot of players. As a base, all machines have a 50% habitability floor, so it's kind of like being subterranean. They will never have below 50% habitability on any world. The devs felt that this was important because they wanted to retain the feel that machines could colonize anywhere reasonably well. Machine habitability traits cover entire planet categories rather than a specific biome. For example, if you are a continental preference, no, 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 you're not, you are a wet preference. There are dry, wet, or frozen habitability preferences, which give only a base of 75% habitability. So, you actually get slightly lower habitability on your guaranteed habitables than regular biological empires. This is a massive change, very, very different to, to play styles. Then you also get 50% habitability on all other natural biomes. I assume this also means you can live on a tomb world relatively well, but, but actually, when you think about it, it would make sense for machines to have 0% habitability on tomb worlds as well. Radiation is really, really damaging to computer systems. That is why, for example, at Chernobyl, when they had to clear the rooftop of uh, radioactive debris, they first off tried sending a robot in there, and the robot simply broke down and were unable to operate after a very short period of time. In order to solve that problem, somewhat terrifyingly, the solution that the Soviet Union came up with was sending in workers for a limited period of time, I think it was 60 to 90 seconds, they would get the maximum possible dose of radiation that they could kind of semi-comfortably withstand without too much problems in terms of getting cancer. Uh, sorry, this has gone down a dark tangent, hasn't it? But, but the point I'm making is that machines are actually less able to deal with highly radioactive environments, or at least computer systems are, than, uh, than, than biological life forms. So being 0% habitability on a tomb world would thematically make a lot of sense, and, and I, I'm actually kind of in favor of that change. As usual, these habitability traits can be changed through robo-modding. Most machine empires will have access to robo-modding from the very start of the game, so you can actually change the species preference on a planet after you've arrived. If, let's say you find a wet world and you're a dry kind of preference, you can change to wet world on that one planet with a couple of pops after you colonize it. Origins like life seeded or subaquatic machines will start with Gaia world or ocean world habitability and will have to research the technology to change their habitability trait. But they retain the 50% habitability floor for being a machine. Okay, so it sounds like tomb worlds will not be 0% habitability there. That I'm kind of finding that a bit sucky, but you know, it is what it is. Just like for lifespan, they will now also gain bonuses from technologies extra habitability from ascensions and new traits. They now also have access to the standard array of habitability technologies. This means actually the machine empires are kind of getting a somewhat nerf, I suppose, because they're getting their society tree clustered up with a bunch of new technologies they wouldn't otherwise have to research. The devs believe this will give them a simplified, more nuanced gameplay experience with niches and combinations that will come close to the old playstyle while allowing for new fantasies. Subterranean machines, which is, again, you'll notice here, basically machines are now getting access to all of the origins pretty much, which is great. That's actually really fun. It sucks that machine empires until now have been kept away from so many different origins. But now you can get subterranean machines, which will have a 100% habitability floor, the base 50 plus another 50 from subterranean, and thus are guaranteed perfect habitability everywhere. So if you want to have the old play style of perfectly habitable on any world, go for subterranean machines. That will do you very, very nicely. We can see here from this screenshot of the sacred Zenak Imperium, the machines are getting access to new traits, like a new version of Aquatic. Waterproof is the machine version of Aquatic. It's granting 20% ocean habitability, minus 10% housing, plus 10% food, energy, and mineral output on ocean worlds, and then some reductions on non-wet worlds, along with the ability to take the hydrocentric ascension perk. That comes from the sub-aquatic machine's origin, which is their version of ocean 
paradise. On top of that, you'll notice here that this machine empire is a death cult, which honestly I find amazing. They are fanatic spiritualist death cults. They kind of believe in a soul, I suppose, and they are happy to unplug some of their robot counterparts. Also, we should also look at here, do you see in the distance, ladies and gentlemen? Can you see that background? That is a machine city set, and oh my goodness me, it looks beautiful. That looks amazing. That, that honestly is, I think, now my new favorite city set. It, it looks not necessarily super machine, but definitely super futuristic. I'll probably be using that with uh, regular bio empires quite a bit. We can also see a little image there of the machine ship set that is coming in. Wow, wow, wow. And if you're enjoying this video, please waterproof that like button. Changes are coming to assimilation as well, an important quality of life improvement for machine empires. They have extended the capacity to assimilate other machines or robots into your main species. This is now available to all machine empires, meaning when you conquer other robot or machine pops, you can set their species rights to assimilation and thus you won't have to do a special project to modify them. They can simply be converted into your primary species type with all of the traits that your primary species has. This is a great quality of life improvement and it basically means that you're going to find it much, much easier to make everybody that you conquer the same as you. The Zenak here may share the same name, but they do not share the same form. These false Zenak will soon become actual Zenak, including adhering to the changing standards of the Zenak. And this is what you get for not being careful with force spawning empires. The changes I've listed so far, the aging, habitability and assimilation changes, and the origin changes that we're going to look at in a moment, are all part of the free 3.12 Andromeda update. So even if you do not pick up this new DLC, you're going to be getting access to all of these new machine changes, along with machines getting access to lots and lots of origins they were previously locked out of. That is super fun, and uh, I think that's a great change that they're going to be bringing in. Let's now look at something new and completely different. Individualistic machine empires. So, Gestalt machine intelligences were originally introduced in the Synthetic Dawn story pack, but the Authority and most of the other civics, other than Determined Exterminator, Driven Assimilator and Rogue Servitor, will also be unlocked by the Machine Age, so you don't need to pick up Synthetic Dawn to be playing as machines. The Machine Age will also allow you to create non-Gestalt machine empires using regular Authority, Ethic and Civic choices, including Spiritualist. These individualistic machines are not guided by an overall Gestalt intelligence, and thus have their own motivations, desires, and disappointments. This of course includes fan favorites like Substance Abuser for your individual machine leaders. Yes, you're going to be jacking up on energy bars? I don't, I don't really know. Uh, as such, you'll be able to play spiritualist machines fully capable of rationalizing your own spiritual superiority compared to lesser machines and organics. Your factions have been adjusted to fit your mechanical existence since it makes no sense for spiritualist robots to despise all robots. It's okay to hate some robots though. You will receive roboticists from your capital building with the additional option of building an assembly plant to boost your production even more. This all comes at the cost of alloys, so carefully decide between expansion, war and pop assembly. As such, individual machines possess happiness like fully recognized synthetics, can and will form factions, and they also consume consumer goods. They're basically regular bio empires except in machine bodies. Individual machines are also very much capable and willing uh, to have the entertainment unique needs. They have no restriction on allowing organics in their empires and can even start the game with organics if you pick the syncretic evolution as their origin of choice. This is um, thematically a little weird. So you can take syncretic evolution as an individualistic machine. Thematically what that could mean from a story perspective is that you had creators and then over time the creators have uh, regressed into a form of near non-sapience and you, however, have stayed uh, better and better. You, you've improved upon yourselves, and now you are the leaders. It's kind of like Rogue Servitors, but without all the Servitor steps. I, I think that's pretty cool. 
This also means that individualistic machine empires have access to technologies for food production, genetic modification, and other organic focused technologies, with a sharply reduced but not zero chance at drawing those technologies if you have no organics in your empire. So basically, you're kind of playing as a regular bio, as I said, but in a machine body. You are at the very least capable of theorizing about meat and its needs compared to geshed out machines. Depending on your ethics and authorities, you can enfranchise, disenfranchise, enslave, or empower organics or even other machines in your empire as you wish. The only limits to your ability to tread upon those fragile organics and your fellow machines are the limits of your imagination. So you can be a genocidal monster, or you could be an egalitarian xenophile that wants to bring peace, love, and freedom to all sapient life in the galaxy. Individual machines have access to most civics for organic empires, as well as a few machine civics like war bots and static research analysis, which have also been adjusted for your individualistic machines. Here we can see a truly despicable sight, a machine empire that is a criminal syndicate with corporate hedonism. There are also fanatic xenophile and pacifists. Note here that these machines have the decadent trait and also the deviant trait. On top of that, we also have a secondary, uh, a new type of uh, background here. Look at the background there. That is a new city type. So we've got two city types. This one looks a little bit more to me like it has come out of Blade Runner or something along those lines. It's kind of like a, a punk industrial type of futuristic city we're seeing there. Also very, very cool. I'm, I very much like these new ship types we're getting. On top of that look, we have yet another ship set. This one is a little bit different. Hard to see what's going on there. This I don't think is the machine focused ship set of the two that we're coming in, or, or maybe it's less machine focused than the previous one we saw kind of outlined in the bottom. Also, these machines are research assistants, so that's probably their version of intelligent, and they can pick the hegemon origin. All of this now means that more origins are available to machine empires. As part of the 3.12 Andromeda release, the devs have done a pass on origins to see if there were any that could have restrictions on machines relaxed. The full list of origins that machine empires have access to as of the 3.12 Andromeda release include syncretic evolution for individualistic only, life seeded, post-apocalyptic called radioactive rovers, I love that one, that's awesome, void dwellers called void forged, hegemon, Ocean Paradise, called Subaquatic Machines, Subterranean, called Subterranean Machines, Arc Welders, Prosperous Unification, Remnants, Shattered Ring, Galactic Doorstop, Resource Consolidation, that one is just for guest outs still, Common Ground, Doomsday, Lost Colony, Here Be Dragons, Slingshot to the Stars, Imperial Fiefdom, amazingly, and interestingly it sounds like you can be a guest out consciousness and be an Imperial Fief Origin too, which is awesome, and Rift World. That now means as a machine you've got about 20 origins to choose between, which is a massive, massive improvement on the previous offering that was out there. With the machine age, both individualistic machines and guest out machines have access to three new ascension paths, which replace the current synthetics tree. By taking the synthetic age ascension perk, you'll begin a new situation to guide them through this momentous transformation. And that situation is called the transformation, as we can see on our screens. Despite the superiority of the machine form, our advancement has remained iterative at best. Self-imposed safety standards have resulted in stagnation. Conclusion. More drastic measures required. Small-scale experiments suggest three distinct options for growth. And here comes the big kicker. These are what the three new ascension paths are. Nanotechnology, which sounds very scary actually when we'll get into that in a moment, and its variable form-shifting advantages. Modularity for individual units optimized with specific characteristics. And virtuality the abandonment of the physical form in favor of a digital existence. Hello Pantheon. Evaluation process initialized, analyze options and deliberate. It seems like you'll get this situation and at the end of it, you'll be able to choose which of the three paths you will take and then pick that tradition tree. 
The first of these paths, which I also think is available to regular empires that synthetically ascend as well, we definitely know it's available for the synth fertility empire, is virtuality. This is a very exciting path that I would say is inspired by the TV show Pantheon, but I've asked the developers and actually no one on the team has seen Pantheon. I have suggested they have a team meeting and watch the important cultural artifact so they can get a better handle on virtuality, but uh, that's just, uh, that was just my comment. Um, so you can embrace a virtual existence for the majority of your population. From the cloud, your pops are created, and to the cloud they will return when their job is done. This is kind of almost religious. Spreading your servers across the stars is an expensive endeavor, but your concentrated efforts are unmatched. Your pops gain a unique virtual trait that becomes stronger as you progress through the tree. You gain a massive bonus to production that is reduced by the number of colonies you have. So this is very much intended for tall empires. Your housing usage is reduced by 90%, so you have absolutely no issues with housing. Of course, I mean, you're a, you're, you're a cloud-based life form. 90% is probably not reasonable. It should be 99.99%, let's be honest, but for making things fair, I think they've capped it at 90. Your habitability floor is increased. The more colonies you gain, the weaker your virtual trait becomes and the bigger its upkeep will become. Additionally, all of your leaders become immortal you gain a new policy to focus your intangible virtual economy. You can choose to focus on research, unity, or governance at the sufferance of the two categories you did not choose. So for example, if you choose research, you'll get some bonuses to research, but some penalties to unity and governance. You'll also gain a bonus to encryption and decryption and additional districts and jobs from districts. That is not all, however. The biggest bonus is that once you finish the tree, you will transition from a pop limited playstyle into a planet limited playstyle, as open jobs will be instantaneously filled with virtual pops as needed. Let me repeat that. Open jobs will be instantaneously filled with virtual pops as needed. Unemployed virtual pops will simply be turned off. So you can increase your economy at the rate of building new buildings. New pops are not grown, they are instantly created for the needs of your empire. This means you can get a dramatic increase in your economy if you shift over possibly around year 20 to 40, and then you'll get some limits later on in the game, but as long as you grab some vassals, you, you know, you get some other bits and pieces, you should still be a very, very powerful empire with, you know, five or six planets. Let's dive now into the details of what these traits do. When you adopt Virtuality, the tradition tree, you'll add the virtual trait to your main species. You'll get plus two code breaking and plus two encryption. And then for the finisher traits, you get, as I mentioned before, the instant creation of virtual pops upon constructing new buildings or districts. And all machine leaders gain the virtual leader trait. We don't know exactly what that does yet, but we know it at least makes all of your leaders completely immortal. I would assume that also possibly they can never be killed in combat or killed out in the galaxy because you'd simply boot up a backup copy. I don't know, maybe that will be the case. As part of the virtuality tradition, you can take clustered capacity. This gives a trait on all of your virtual pops. The virtual species trait gives you plus 150% resources from jobs. Yes, you heard me right, 150% additional resources from jobs. This number, however, is reduced by 25% for every colony. So if you have a capital and four other worlds, you will be getting minus 100% reduction in this bonus down to 50% additional resources from jobs. Five worlds is not that many, but if you've got five good big planets, that actually could be quite a lot, especially paired with a plus 50% output to resources from every worker, every researcher, every metallurgist on every planet. The minimum this can go to though is minus 75%. So at a total of nine planets, that's one capital and eight colonies, you will hit this minimum 
possible value of minus 75%, which is pretty brutal and pretty bad. You don't really want to go below having six colonies. That's a total of seven planets because that is the plus zero percent resources from jobs modifier, I would suspect. On top of that, you get an increase in upkeep per pop, which is tied to the number of colonies you have plus 0.1 energy credits per colony. So with four colonies, including the capital, that's a total of five worlds, you're looking at 0.4 energy credits per colony. On top of that, we can also see the virtual trait here, granting minus 90% housing usage, plus 25% minimum species habitability, and plus 150% resources from jobs, but minus 25% per colony and also the energy upkeep. That minimum habitability, when tied in with the fact that you are a robot, means you are at a minimum habitability of 75% on every single planet, I believe. We will have to see how quickly you can rush this ascension path. If you can do it in the first 20 to 30 years, this is amazingly powerful. If you only have three planets, that means you're getting plus 100% resources from jobs in every planet, and you're only limited by the speed at which you can build additional buildings. This could be honestly utterly broken. It does fall off though, a bit like the clone army origin. You can't get too big, but you can of course take vassals and that sort of thing. So, so maybe it's going to be uh, quite a unique and interesting playstyle. I'm looking forward to trying it out. The nanotech ascension path is basically grey goo. I'm pretty sure it's an existential threat to the entire galaxy. Big things are made of small things. By becoming a flood of nanites, your empire changes not just its makeup, but also its economy and growth strategy. Grow, exploit, replicate. Yeah, you're gonna be grey goo. It, you're, you're, you're basically an existential threat to all life everywhere, I think unless you can choose to coexist with, uh, with the rest of the galaxy. While virtual machines may seek a tall playstyle, nanotech machines flood across the galaxy like an off-white or silvery tempest specializing in the physical. You'll gain access to, number one, ways to transform basic resources into nanites and nanites into advanced resources. You're kind of like the, uh, the tempest, which can be found out in the L gates, I think. A new decision, similar to the Terravore world consumption, will be granted to you, allowing you to turn colonies into nanite worlds. A new starbase building to harvest nanites from uninhabitable worlds will be created. New edicts to vastly increase your production or combat capability at the cost of nanites. Nanite probe ships to bolster your fleets. And, as mentioned before, subsume world decision and a nanotech world. The exact effects here, the devs are very much keeping to themselves. We can see though, we have subsume world, transfigure this world, creating one or more blockers that reduce the habitability and districts of this world, but will provide more nanites for the food. Provide more nanites for the food? Provide more food for the nanites, I think it should say? Unless it means more nanites for the food, in which case I'm deeply concerned. That does sound like an existential threat, good lord. That starts a situation as well, interesting. Then we've also got the nanite world here, 50% habitability. There's also clearly some sort of modifier happening on the planet that looks something to do with a cracked or broken planet. Very, very interesting stuff. The exact specifics, as I mentioned, are not being shown to us, however. Here we can also see what the nanite probes look like. They look like smaller versions of the Grey Tempest ships. They are clearly bolstering a fleet here of machine ships. I believe this is the machine ship set. Very, very interesting stuff. I wonder how effective these nanite probes are going to be in combat. I'm assuming that they'll be very fast and easy to build. You can build massive swarms of them and they'll probably operate like corvettes or possibly something even smaller. I'm guessing low damage output, low health, low shields, and probably no shields actually, and some armor. They'll probably get hull regeneration over time. In fact, as a nanite empire, imagine that you're getting hull regeneration modifiers empire-wide that are maybe even working during combat. That could be very, very interesting. The last of the three ascension paths for Gestalt and individual machines is modularity, which kind of seems to be the machine version of a genetic ascension. The most advanced machine traits require the most advanced minds. By embracing modularity, your empire will have access to traits other machines can only theorize at. 
the rarest of resources, will fuel your enhanced shells. Your metallurgists will produce living metal. I assume that is in addition to their regular alloy output. Uh, unless you're replacing alloys with living metal, that could be very weird and interesting, but uh, we'll have to see. The roboticist will be boosted by utilizing living metal as an upkeep, so you'll probably have much faster uh, robot production. Your workers and simple drones will be boosted by your priest equivalent job. So I guess that just means your tradition job. Your soldiers and enforcers will grant more stability and be stronger. You'll also get access to nine advanced machine traits, several trait picks, points, and a reduced modification cost. Yes, it sounds very much like the genetic ascension, but for machines. All of your leaders will gain the synth leader trait, which I assume makes them live longer, if not immortal, and you get access to the modularity tradition tree. If you have synthetic dawn, but do not have the machine age, you will retain access to the synthetics tree but with some rework traditions. These will include bonuses to lifespan, habitability, and pop assembly. For everyone else, you get modularity. One example of what this tradition does is advanced tools. Utilizing the galaxy's rarest resources and cutting edge technologies, we've engineered unparalleled mechanical augmentations. You unlock the advanced traits for species modification, you get four more modification points, and four more machine trait picks, as well as minus 50% modify species special project cost. That is quite a lot of changes. Modularity very much seems like the ascension you'll go for if you want to keep your playstyle pretty much the same. You don't want to become a nano swarm, and you don't want to go into a virtualized world. This, I think, makes more sense than what we have presently with the synthetic ascension tree. Uh, but, um, yeah, we'll have to see what all those new traits are. I'm looking forward to more updates there. Let me know down in the comments below which of these three new ascension paths you're more excited by. For owners of Synthetic Dawn, Driven Assimilators will gain two new advanced authority possibilities in the Machine Age. First off, the Memory Aggregators, and second, the Neural chorus. Upon completing the cybernetic tradition tree, the assimilator will receive the option to pursue a more collectivist or more individualistic stance on the variants of thought permitted within the Gestalt consciousness. Here we can see that Neural Chorus is granting us not just a bunch of bonuses, but also a brand new edict, Choral Harmony, which gives us 10% extra resources from all cyborg pops in the Empire. Neural Chorus grants some Empire effects. The ruler has the same effects as basic uh, machine intelligence authority, but the Empire effects here are plus one cyborg leader starting level, a 25% reduction to cyborg leader upkeep, plus one extra pops when you establish a colony, that's the same as a regular machine authority, plus 0.1 unity from every cyborg pop empire wide, and plus 10% cyborg upkeep. I assume Neural Chorus is going to be not the uh, collectivist, but the individualistic stance, whereas Memory Aggregator might be the more collectivist stance. I wonder what that one is going to do. One more thing to note, Neural Chorus says you cannot follow the Psionic, Cybernetic, or Genetic Ascension paths, but in the Dev Diary they mention completing the Cybernetic Tradition Tree. Perhaps they mean completing the new Synthetic Ascension Tree, though I'm, uh, I'm really not entirely sure. Here is a beautiful rendition of one of the two new ship sets, the machine ship set. This one does look pretty mechanical. I'm, I'm finding those kind of radiator fins or possibly solar panel arrays on the rightmost ship quite interesting. I think that is a cruiser. I'm pretty sure we've got a cruiser on the right. I think at the front there, we've got a destroyer. There's clearly a Titan with a Titan Lance. The top left is probably a battleship. And the, the bottom left, those two ships between the Titan and the battleship, I think, are our corvettes slash frigates. Very interesting ship uh, ship design here. I'm, I, I think it's another cool design. Very awesome to have extra designs added in that we can use. Extra uh, skins, basically. This DLC seems to be bringing a massive amount to it. We, we kind of have a species pack and an expansion all rolled into one. Again, there's no price point being mentioned in the dev diary. We will have to wait and see what price it's going to come in at. 
the more we see, the, the more I am convinced that they are going to be marketing this at the higher price of $30 or 30 euros, rather than sticking with the previous prices that we had, for instance, you know, two years ago in 2022 with expansions, that was $20 or 20 euros. If it is at that price, that is quite a high price. That's 75% of the base game price for a single DLC. Uh, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Let me know down in the comments below what your thoughts are. Next week, we're going to be looking at new civics and structures, as well as auto modding, a new concept coming in with the Machine Age DLC. If you've enjoyed this video on the new DLC, The Machine Age, which is coming to Stellaris very, very soon, and you'd like more information, for example, you'd like to find out all about the new origins coming in this next DLC, click the video on screen now.